Welcome home. We are WNST AM 1570, Taos of Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. We have uh, positively done a lot of baseball and uh, the new ownership of David Rubenstein. Uh, I'll be continuing to monitor all things baseball and report back on what I know. I, I have a dear David Rubenstein letter that um, I, I have been putting together through the first homestand and I'm just kind of watching it all. It's all so dreamy and weird to me uh, after all of these years of the Angelos family. And I even saw um, John Angelos, wife put a little Instagram up that they're down in the islands and they're on to their next chapter. And I wish them well, I really, really do. And I certainly am wishing this group well, and I'll be monitoring that uh, Luke and I'll be monitoring that next Friday on the 12th. We will be at Fadley's uh, before the Orioles games. We're live for the first time since February. Uh, we'll be live from 2 until 5. Stop down, see Luke and I from 2 until 3. I will have 10 times the cash. Can't promise I'm going to have these exact ones next Friday because I might be into the Pac-Man. Because on Tuesday, we're going to be at Costas, not live, but hanging out before the Orioles-Red Sox game. That is on the 9th. Please come and support Costas. I know they had a big thing for Key Brewing down there. Anybody down on the peninsula, whether it's Fort Howard, Edgemere, uh, Sparrows Point, near Bethlehem Steel, near Trey Point Atlantic, Pops Tavern. There's two Rofos down there. Go support them. Buy some fried chicken um, and uh, support my friends over Drug City. Everybody on that side of town that's now a little bit more landlocked. And um, it's worth the extra effort. Ray Bachman down there in Pasadena. That's my shout out to Ray because um, we're doing a 25th anniversary documentary recapping all the madness of WNST and my crazy career. And now with a new ownership on the baseball side, uh, we still have the same ownership on the football side. Luke Jones joins me now to discuss what is a really strange time, Luke. I don't know the last time, and even when the Orioles are in the playoffs, which they've been in 12, 14, 16, you and I have been together almost two decades now, going on the second half of that, and where we just put down football. Like, you and I were in Orlando. I had the owner, the billionaire owner of the team who's been in my home run for me on a veranda with the general manager. You're with the head coach. All this stuff happens. Then the bridge falls. Opening day happens. Cal Ripken has a press conference and David Rubinson and the Orioles win games. And lo and behold, you and I never even did a football segment because we got off the plane. There's no bridge. All this crazy stuff. happened. It's like the Ravens just froze for a week, like an embryonic state. The, the owner. I've never I haven't asked you anything about Harbaugh's breakfast. I haven't asked you anything about how that delicious salmon was on the buffet and whether you saw Roger Goodell at the pool or not. But I saw Steve Bashotti twice with my own eyes. I uh, saw Chad Steele playing bodyguard. I mean, I saw, I watched it all. We had wonderful conversations with people all around the league. Alex Marvez and I took a long walk on the veranda and discussed the AEW. You'll have, you, you didn't even know about this stuff. I kept from you as I was stealing oranges from various Marriott properties that I brought back here so I could have a proper orange crush to start the season, man. So uh, happy uh, a football draft season to you. It's a, uh, it's no joke and it's certainly not April fools, but there's still a football team here. Don't tell the baseball people that, right? Right, right. And, and it's not going anywhere. And they're still in really good position, even if you have some very significant questions uh, about this roster construction, which we knew we knew this was going to be the case. That's why we were talking at such length in November and December and the first half of January in terms of taking advantage of the opportunity you had at that point, knowing that you were going to experience attrition on the coaching side. You were going to experience attrition on the players roster side. Uh, and we've certainly seen that uh, we've seen them add Derek Henry, but we've seen them lose a number of players. They've kept a few, but there are very substantial questions. And what's funny is you met, made mention of the coaches breakfast breakfast and John Harbaugh speaking early last week in Orlando one of the first things I would have brought up was he still had optimism about Jadavion Clowney returning. And he has since officially joined the Carolina Panthers close to home, more money than the Ravens were going to give him, give him. So uh, that's, you know, just a, uh, another individual, another significant member of their defense to depart here in this 2024 off season. So we've reached the point in the NFL calendar where the NFL would tell you that it's thriving. And look, there is a very, sizable 
portion of the NFL fan base that does love the draft, and we're diving into that uh, much more so. But if you have other interests like March Madness, like the beginning of the baseball season, locally, certainly lacrosse season, uh, WrestleMania, as dorks like me will talk about. They still There's run a horse race this and time this, of year, too. I'll, I'll get Dick Girardi, too. So I'll, I'll throw that in from a horse racing friends out there. Yeah, we're, we're, well, uh, but that's still, you know, that's still about a month away for that. But the point is, we kind of reached the point in the NFL calendar where free agency, first, second, third, fourth waves of free agency are done now, right? We're we're three weeks into that conversation. And yeah, there are still some good players out there. Yeah, the Ravens could still sign some good players. And maybe they bring back Kyle Van Noy still because the Clowney is now officially off the market and uh, do, having departed the Ravens. But you, know, you kind of get to the beginning of April and okay, well, the Liars luncheon will be coming up here soon. <laughs> I mean, I mean, that, that is what it is. As I wear, I'm a blonde out. person on my shirt. Right. <laughs> Literally. Right. So, so you have that event, but we know that there's not going to be anything of substance that comes from that. And that's, it's been that way for a long, long time. Right. I mean, that's not you anything. Pass out gummies for it to make any sense to me. <laughs> but, 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 the, but the point I'm trying to make is you kind of reach it's not a lull because it's not for the teams because they are doing all the pre-draft evaluation. But in terms of making news, the fan fan base at this point, it's kind of like, okay, well, we're three and a half weeks out from the draft, right? I mean, that's, yeah, but, that's but where hang we are. On. I mean, the fan base was up in arms about Clowney. So let's go back and revisit that a little bit. The Clowney Van Noy, the fact that this time last year – um you know, nobody would have said you have to have those guys or those guys are essential. We went out and watched them play, right? And now we're going to watch them play without Clowney. And, you know, they're always in search of this Elvis Doomerville, always in search of this veteran guy that they're chasing that it was a Belichick thing, right? I have Chad Brown on all the time. He was that guy, Uh, you know, at that point in his career, once you get into your 30s, and whether it was Demata Pekka a couple of years, you know, and I feel that way about the baseball team too, that like with this new owner, they'll buy a pitcher, you know, there'll, there'll be some guy we don't know about that will add the Rodriguez and, and Corbin Burns and all of our enthusiasm for October. If, if this guy's serious and he wants to win and he's a billionaire, blah, 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 football, salary cap, this, that patience, patience in Ozzy, we trust in Eric, we trust all that stuff. I, I thought Clowney and Van Noy were a pretty essential part of parts of what they did last year in regard to success. And they sort of pulled a rabbit out of the hat. Right. And they're good at this. George Kukinas is good at this. Now they don't have Joe on the, the scouting mm-hmm. side, but they've been preparing for all of this loss. And, you know, you and I are talking to Mike McDonald. He's out in Seattle. He's gone before he got here, kind of sort of to some degree. Um, it, philosophically, anyway, there are going to be some changes with Zach or, but players and the the edge and that value and that position and we'll get a guy and we'll find a guy. That's how they found these guys. But I am um, I'm a little bit more on the fan base side of saying, yeah, it would have been nice to have Clowney and Van Noy back. But he played like a ten million dollar edge rusher and they don't they can't afford that. And this is the difference between shopping before Lamar's contract and after to some degree. Sure, sure. I mean, look, I'm I'm not sitting here saying that I expected or even that I would have definitely said that I would pay Jadavion Clowney two years, 20 million. What max value, I think, is up to 24 million uh, to be in Carolina. But that said, you can agree with saying, OK, they can't afford that or maybe that's not the best way to spend for them. Making the bet that Clowney's going to back to back have seasons uh, like he had for the Ravens this past year to do that again knowing his injury history, knowing he'll be another year older. I mean, those are fair points. But that said, you still have to replace the production. And they're still, for as successful as they were, signing Clowney the third week of August and signing Kyle Van Noy in late September, they've also signed Jason Pierre-Paul two years ago where didn't make the big impact, right? I mean, so, so it's not as though they bat a thousand, but yeah, they are really good at doing that. But it's just another challenge of, okay, what are you doing about edge? Because- Really, the issue, and it's funny, how many straight off seasons now have we been talking about edge rushers? You have to go back to the end of Terrell Suggs, right? 
You know, well, they I mean, haven't it, drafted a good one. That's where you're going, right? And and that's ex- that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. This is this is where you look at this and say, okay, Adafi Owe. And by the way, Owe was better this past year than he was the year before that. He did take a step forward. Has he taken that massive leap where you say, okay, that's our guy. We want to extend him. We can't let him get get away. And in fairness, they would tell you, but we do have Justin Matabike as an inside pass rusher, which so many teams do not have a talent like that. And I would say you're absolutely right. And they that, just paid him. Sure, exactly. So, but that's where we get into. And notice, you mentioned Lamar, post Lamar contract, paying Justin Matabike, got other guys that they have paid. Rokon Knowing Smith, that Hamilton and Linderbaum, they're coming, right? They're coming, Literally. but that's also, we've reached the the point now. And this is where, you know, as I mentioned, waiting on the draft, it's not to be dismissive of anything that could happen over the next few weeks, but the draft becomes even more important than it already is for this franchise. And this is how saw- you spiritually fill these holes. Is right, you're thinking, exactly. I'm going to get a guy here in the second round, and you know, by week 14, he's going to be a player, a guy we yeah. can trust. And, and this is where it's been disappointing through no fault of his own. But, I mean, where are they with David Ajabo right now, right? I mean, if Ajabo had been – the really good number three edge rusher this past year and stayed on the field and I don't know, finished with six sacks, let's say, but like showed some really good signs. Pressure rate was good. Pass rush, win weight, all all the different things that you you try to measure uh, in a pass rusher beyond just the sack total. Uh, If he had done that, then Clowney going out the door, I don't think you bat an eyelash really, but it is different through the lens of, okay, I'll sign off on OA not saying always going to be the next Suggs or the next Jumerville or even the next Matt Judon, but I can sign off on saying OA is a starting player. Fine. I'll go that far. And a lot of people listening would say, no way, Luke, I disagree with that. But I'm just giving them the benefit of the doubt there. But Ajabo has played, what, five games in two years? And keep in mind, him coming out of Michigan, as much as people love the talent and were mocking him potentially being the Ravens' first-round pick before he tore his Achilles at his Michigan Pro Day – there he was green you know he was considered a raw prospect so he's for me it's not even about that okay well, he they always been on the think field. they can coach him up that's part that's part of the fillet but you have to, but you yeah, have to do it. it you have to be on the field you have to be on the practice field to develop and i think as much as you say okay well he's only played in 5 games he's also missed so much development time through over the last couple of years so that's where you look through the lens and say they need some more help at pass rush uh, at the edge rusher spot. So whether it ends up still being, yeah, they could still resign Kyle Van Noy. He's 33. You know, he's not going to command. I, I, no one's going to give him what Carolina just gave Clowney. You know, I'd be stunned to see him anywhere in that territory. But at the same time, he is three years older than Jadavion Clowney. And while he was good, he wasn't as good as Clowney. Clowney was a better player than Van Noy this past year. So, you know, what's the price point? You know, where is he in his career and what he what he values? And where are the Ravens in terms of how they value him? So, you know, the point is they're probably going to be looking to draft an edge guy at some point over the first few rounds. But we're talking about that position. We're talking about the offensive line, which, you know, I, I'm going to bring that up because – but they've got three open starting spots right now. But they got a hell of a running back. They do. They do. And look, <laughs> I, and look, I'm going to keep I, pointing I, I, that out. <laughs> you're you're going to keep needling me until until uh, uh, until Derrick Henry runs for 1,500 yards this year. You know year what and... I really need to do? I need to find one of those Derrick Henry Oiler jerseys that's on sale. <laughs> that yeah. fits me. And every yeah. time we talk about the offensive line, I'm just going to put on my Derrick Henry Oiler jersey. But I, w- but I will say this, and I will not move off of this point because I have that much conviction about it. As it stands right now, and Eric and Ozzy would tell you right now, yeah, the season doesn't start until September. And I'd say, yes, I understand that. But right now, the net gain, that they, the net positive that they have at running back does not offset the net loss at offensive line until we see what this offensive line looks like. The offensive line impacts everything you do. Your running game, passing game. I mean, it's, you know. Well, that's it, where they'll spend some of that clowny money and replacing a Zeitler with a Zeitler and a Moses with a Moses. Like, that's I mean, how they probably are thinking about this, of getting one veteran, one draft pick, and one yeah. Ben Cleveland that's hanging around, or one McCary that you, you know what I mean? Sure. Like that's how they're thinking about it. 
I think so. Yeah. I mean, whether that works out or not, we'll see, because we've also seen them have years, you know, go back a few years ago when they thought that Alejandro Villanueva was going to be a good enough insurance policy for Ronnie. Stanley. Well, dude, this time last year, if you would have told me they're getting Kyle Van Noy and Jadavian oh, Clowney, yeah. I would have said you're getting um, Andre Garad and, you know, I, make up any any guy that didn't work out. Sure. I, you know, you brought up John, P- Pierre Paul, right? So like any of those guys that didn't make it sort of kind yeah. of those two guys could have easily have been that easily. Uh, yeah. And I mean, that's you, why you, they walked on Clowney at $20 million because they have his x-rays. Yeah. And, and they probably said, look, we, we got outstanding surplus value for what we paid him. Let's be clear. Let's be careful not to give that all back in year two. So, but you still have to replace that production. And, and that's the, that's my overall prevailing point here. Uh, but you know, with the offensive line, you know, even if you get those pieces, even if you find the right veteran, you make the right veteran acquisition. Let's say you draft, uh, you know, I'll, I'll throw a name out there, Amarius Mims, you know, the offensive tackle from Georgia that's been talked about a lot that is kind of a high ceiling but high risk player in terms of he's had some injuries and, and you know, he's kind of a boomer bust prospect, which, you know, when you're picking 30th. You know, you're not going to get a perfect prospect at number 30. You know, this isn't drafting J.O. fourth overall. This isn't drafting Ronnie Stanley's, what, sixth overall. I mean, you're talking about a guy that's going to have some warts in some kind of way. That doesn't mean he won't be a great player eventually, but profile-wise, he's going to have some question marks. So, you know, even if they add the right veteran, even if they draft someone 30th overall, hey, even if you get lucky, and when I say lucky, meaning you've identified a guy, but he falls to you, you know, a guy that you love in the third round, let's say. And maybe that's a guy that might be able, might be ready to start at left guard in year one. Maybe he's that, you know, that talented, but kind of fell through the cracks a little bit from the eval- uh, an evaluation standpoint. There's still no guarantee all that's going to mesh. We know how important it is for an offensive line to play together. Uh, so that's just it's it's a question mark right now it is that doesn't mean that i think the ravens aren't a playoff team right now or or aren't a super bowl contender right now but until we see these questions answered of course you're going to have some some reservations right you have to take pause these are too important uh you know these spots are too important to just you know view it through the lens of oh well you know that's a backup safety or you know a third corner you know i mean which by the way those are two other positions that they that they uh, you know, we'll certainly be looking to address via the draft, I'm sure. So, you know, it's just but when you get to early April, this is kind of the time period where things slow down a little bit in terms of making headlines uh, with roster moves. And you're looking at the draft. I think fans start to look at the draft more. You know, pro days are ongoing or wrapping up. You know, we, we've seen some of those here recently and we'll continue to over the next couple of weeks. You know, maybe some news leaks out about the visits, you know, official visits that that guys make around the league and who the Ravens might potentially host. But, you know, when you're picking 30th, Eric DaCosta can probably sit there and tell you, probably give you a list of eight guys and feel pretty confident when they're picking at 30th, assuming they stay there and they're not trading back or whatever, probably tell you eight guys and feel like he could pick from that list of eight that that will be their pick. But I mean, you have 29 other spots in front of you. I mean, Nestor, I mean, that's just – there are so many variables there at work, so much unknown there in terms well, I of – I always think that they they would uh, – that given where they are and picks, they'd almost rather back up and take two in the late 40s and one at 30. And yeah, that's yeah. how they evaluate all of this is saying, we'll take our chances on the Mark Andrews, Orlando Brown part of the draft and try to find those kinds of players in that kind of an area before we wind up getting a guy that – has dropped out that we don't see the value in yeah. uh, other than finding like a Linderbaum or a guy, you know, like if they find the best guard in the draft at, you know, some Quentin Nelson type of guy that they, you know, they feel about like whatever that I, I could see that being something that they could stay up for, but they could also feel like we'll take the third best offensive lineman in the draft at 48 and we would be better at, at that part of the draft. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah. And that's got to be available as it plays out for you. But their needs are different, not needing a quarterback and not needing a game changer, a ball, uh, someone touching the ball. Um, 
you know, they want a lot of football. You know, I can hear sure. the arrogance of DaCosta right now if he were still having coffee from me instead of running from me in the middle of the night after 30 years, um, that he would say, you know, I'll take my chances, you know, like, and I know how cocky they are and I know how good they are at what they do. They got a lot of parts here and they'd say, got a lot of good football players here. Just had yeah. to give, had to give a defensive tackle a billion dollars because he was that good. And we figured that out and we found him. Where do we find him? Where do we draft him, Luke? Yeah. You know, Third like, round. so, right. So that, you know, they're always thinking more like we find players between 50 and 100 that other people can't find. And that's how we win. But then when they find them, they got to pay them yeah. <laughs> or, or, or chase them off to the lions and get a, get a, get a sandwich pick and figure out how to make something out of pick 124, you know? Yeah. And you just made mention of the possibility of trading back. I mean, I talked to someone last week in Orlando that presented that uh, as very much a possibility. And I'll go back to the, you know, just the little example that I gave there where I said that, the Costa might have eight players that he kind of thinks will be there when they're picking at 30, you know, someone from that list. But of those eight, Nestor, there might be only two guys that they really, truly say, wow, we love that guy. You can like plenty of players, but if you only like a guy there and you've got a chance to move back to say, I don't know, 42, but you can pick up then a third, an early third round, you know, whatever. The, you know, I don't have the draft trade chart in front of me, but you understand the point. Well, I'm you making mentioned here. Owen. I mean, that was part of a guy like him, that those are the guys they really like. Yeah, sure, sure. Absolutely. So, but at the same time, they, they really liked Owe and a couple years in, you know, it's, it's been a mixed bag, right? So you never really know. As, and Eric has said this. I've heard Mike Elias say this uh, about the baseball draft. As much as you try to make it science, you know, and, and especially now, there's so much player tracking data that they have that kind of makes, you know, the 40 time at the combine. I mean, it's such a small, tiny little piece of the evaluation puzzle. Uh, but they have so much tracking data. They have so much information. But they'll still tell you, as much as we try to make it as scientific as possible, Still all art involved. Dude, There's we're talking art. about a, a team that, that went all in on Hayden Hurst and five minutes later drafted Lamar to throw him out the door. Exactly. So, right. <laughs> as I've said over and over, I mean, th th and that's I, I, I don't say this as a knock on the Ravens. It's just an overall statement on that process itself. Everyone passed on Lamar Jackson, including the Ravens once. So, you know, I mean, that's Well, how that's about how this, man? Your, your brother-in-law is all eagles up and sixes and the Phillies and all. This, go look at the Eagles quarterback situation over the last 10 years. Just go evaluate that. Get Howard Eskin or Spadaro or any of those guys I was drinking with, uh, you know, at the bar up in, uh, in Philadelphia a couple. Uh, uh, well, I was drinking with them in Orlando, but I was with the Eagles contingent. Look at their quarterback history and signings and contracts. Uh, and they've won a Super Bowl and, lo and, and lost another one that they could have. Like, and they've evaluated these drafts and their picks yeah. and their talent sort of weirdly, if you were writing a history of it and they've been. Yeah. It's really hard to do that. I can't emphasize that enough. Even the ones that are the best at doing it. And we just talked about two teams who have been really good with it uh, historically over the long haul, the Ravens and the Eagles and, you know, throw some other teams in there that have drafted really, really well. It's still very difficult to do. You're still going to have more misses than hits. And even when you talk about hits, there's drafting a, a guy that's going to be a multi-year starter for you. There's drafting a guy that's going to be a Pro Bowl player for you. And then, oh, yeah, there's drafting guys that will go to the Hall of Fame. You know, Ozzie Newsome drafted J.O. fourth overall and was fortunate enough, smart enough as well, but fortunate enough that Ray Lewis was still sitting there at the end of the first round, right? I mean, completely changed the trajectory of the entire franchise uh, with that one pick. Ray Lewis goes six spots before that. Who knows how it plays out? I mean, so th it's really difficult to do, and there's still a lot of luck involved. And that's part of why the Ravens value what? As many picks as they can, because they view it through the lens of they're not lottery tickets because it's more sophisticated than that. But at the same time, and DaCosta has used this analogy a lot about wide receivers. And I've talked about this a lot, you know, 
until recently, we know for a long time there, the Ravens were so risk averse with their wide res- at the wide receiver position that they didn't take as many swings. Even they weren't even really trying to draft receivers, but you got to take swings. You know, you got, you got to go for it sometimes. And sometimes it's going to work out and you're going to look like a genius. And then other times it's going to look like, Oh yeah, that, that guy wasn't very good. So fortunately for the Ravens, it's been much more of the former where you say, yeah, it's worked out pretty well. Yeah, there's there's some Matt Elams in there. There's some Prashad Perrimans in there. No no doubt. Every team has those guys. But they also drafted Jonathan Ogden, and they drafted Ray Lewis, and they drafted Lamar Jackson, who was a two-time MVP through his first six seasons. I mean, they've also drafted Mark Andrews and, and Marshall yeah. Gonda and the, you know, late picks that have blossomed in some Dallas Thomas guys that have just been Look good at, football players and Jared Johnson's and just, I mean, they've just gotten, they, they've gotten solid. Look, they're as good at this. That's how Eric's kept his job for 28 years. Um, <laughs> amongst other things. But I, I, I would say for me, I trust in their, arrogance that we'll figure out the clowny thing. We'll figure out the edge thing. We'll figure out, we got the running back. Uh, this is where I reach for my, I'm going to get it. Down. I'm going to find me a cheap Chinese knockoff of an Oilers Jersey. And I'm going to put it on a little 22. Cause I look good in it. And I like it anyway. And it says Henry on the back and I don't, I don't even, Oh, Henry. Um, but for me, I, I, I think that they've, they've spoken. Eric agrees with me. They needed a running back. They needed a big fat running back. They needed a guy to take a load off of a Lamar. They've agreed with me. They gave him the money. Now that now they they have to deal with you saying, well, who's going to play card tag? Who's going to block for him? <laughs> right. Exactly. So, exactly. No, I mean, it's, and let's and, and I'm glad you framed it the way you just did because it comes down to this. What they do in the regular season. Look, they could line up today, even with my concerns about the offensive line. And even with needing an edge rusher, they could line up today and kick off the season today. I'd have them in the playoffs. I, I mean, okay, we could sit there and say, all right, is Cincinnati going to be back at the same level they were before the Burrow injury? And they had won the division two years in a row. They'd be in the playoffs. I I'd, I'd would feel to, confident To your point, if you that. were a gambler, and we would warn everybody, you know, 1-800-GAMBLER, yeah. we always say, but, but if you were a gambler, you'd place a bet on them. Going to say you don't even need to know who their guard or tackle is. They got I'd, a quarterback. They got. I'd Derek have them Henry. in the playoffs. Right, but there but you go. but but this is where we get to the kind of the tough element of the discussion. It's all about what happens when they get there at this. How point. do you I run mean, the it's... ball in Buffalo in January? Right. How you know <laughs> Lamar playing at a higher level, John Harbaugh having this team ready to play at a you know not panicking you know well, coaching decisions. Uh, undisciplined penalties that they, you know, whatever it is, like we've seen it and we've seen it multiple times. I, I mean, it's, it's part of their identity now until they change it. Right. They're so far removed from their last Super Bowl. I mean, it's 11 years ago, 12 years ago at, at this point, Justin Tucker's the only guy hanging on. Right. Uh, God bless. I'm going to go. Hey, 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 hey. Flacco's still got a job in Indy now. Well, Come I'm, on. But, I'm, but I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm talking about guys on the roster, you know, guys that are still Ravens today, but you know, that's ancient history. So, I mean, th- this current era, look, I don't need to see them go 13 and four. I don't need to see them go 15 and two. Uh, I, look, okay. If they went 17 and oh, yeah, that would be history. And we'd be talking about the Patriots and the 72 Dolphins. But beyond that, I mean, it's all about January at this point. So that's, that's where, look, I can sit here and not be as over the moon about the Derrick Henry signing. And ultimately it comes down to, does he help you win playoff games? Does he help you get to a Super Bowl? If he rushes for 1,500 yards, but he doesn't move the needle in January, I'll, I'll look back at that and say, okay, well, hey, it was fun watching Derrick Henry. I love the watching ball more than three times. Well, it's, sure, sure, of course. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm not even talking. But, but well, they were laughing about it and pissing on him, but they did that. And that's how sure. they got eliminated. It's, it's well, unbelievable. It's more than that, just that. Lamar's, Lamar didn't play well. I mean, honestly, that that's, that's the difficult part of the conversation that, he got thoroughly outplayed by Patrick Mahomes. I mean, it's just that simple. But, yeah, they didn't run the ball either, and they made some not-so-great penalties in some critical spots on defense that hurt them. And you know, But anyway, not, not to dwell on that, but it's just the big-picture equation here is everything they do, and that's why even going back to the O-line, I made mention the scenario where they find 
that, that veteran acquisition, whether it's after the draft, whether it's in August, they trade, you know, some swap pick trade where they acquire some team's guard veteran guard on an expiring contract because they drafted a kid in the second round that they like, and they're going to save some cap space. You know, you acquire someone like that, you draft someone that's going to be ready to go and Ben Cleveland or Andrew Voorhees or whoever it might be. That's an incumbent is ready to start. All of that plays out. They're still going to need time to gel, but you know what? That's okay. As long as the base, as long as the floor is high enough that they're winning games to make the playoffs and all that. We saw here the last time this team played in the Super Bowl, they had an offensive line that was in flux all season long until when they insert Bryant McKinney left tackle. Michael Hoare moves over to right tackle. Kaleche Osemele moves from right tackle to left guard and boom, they were off and running and Joe Flacco went on a historic run and the rest Rest is history, Super Bowl champions. So everything they do at this point in time, for me, it's not even really about week one. It's about what's going to have you at the point come the, it's what now the second or third week of January. So the timing's so weird because we say January, but the regular season doesn't end until the second week of January at this point. But it's all about positioning yourself for that moment. And that's why I said where they stand right now, even with their flaws, even with their roster holes, they're a playoff team for me, <laughs> even if they just rely on the draft and that's that, you know, but it's all about maximizing and being ready for what you're going to be in January. So that's where I say, okay, they can have some choppy offensive line play early on, not to the point where you get Lamar hurt, mind you, but it doesn't have to be perfect in September or October, but you want it to be at its highest level come January. And, you know, that's what they're, that's kind of, that's the overall challenge for this team at this point. I mean, it's sure. Would they like the number one seed again and a buy again? Sure. Because that just the probability, right? It's one less game that you have to play, but you know, it's all about winning games then. And you know, whatever they can do now, whether it's signing a running back as they did in Derrick Henry or drafting a, an offensive tackle or a guard 30th overall, or finding uh, hitting out on an edge rusher, which is something they're you know, kind of overdue to be able to do at this point. Um, you know, whatever it might be, we'll, we'll see what it looks like come January. And ultimately, you know, uh, again, because we'll, I'm, I think we're going to talk about Derrick Henry all year. Uh, and again, I'm looking forward to watching him play, but how's he helped them win games in January? You know, we've seen them have great running games, you know, n- number one in the league in rushing this past year, even with running backs who everyone said were so bad or whatever, but you know, how's he helped them win in January? That's everything they do at this point. Uh, they're, they're looking at it through that through that lens. And, you know, they're, they're a playoff team. You know, assuming Lamar's healthy, they're a playoff team, period. We've seen it over and over and over at this point. When Lamar's upright and healthy, they're a playoff team. So that's not in doubt, but it's a matter of what can you do between now and then to be ready to roll in January and finally break through because, you know, that's what everyone's waiting for at this point. And understandably so, given the regular season success they've had over the last five years. I'm going to find a Nashville retailer that has an abundance of (laughs) Derek Henry. 50% off, right? 50, (laughs) 80. I mean, come on. I pay more than 29 99 for that, but, and it's gotta be, it's gotta fit me. Right. Uh, Luke Jones here. You know, I tell you, no wonder these owners run from, from us when, when, you know, 13 and four, and it's not good enough. And you're worried about our guard. You know, 101 wins, and we got Burns and Rodriguez, and you're worried about who we're going to acquire at the pick. Well, I mean, that's – I mean, the bar has been raised here. Um, oh, it's a good thing. And, yeah, all the way around, in the same way we're like, who's going to pitch game one in October? That's – if that's what we're talking about on April Fool's Day, then, you know, we, we have a really, really active sports environment here that turns me on. I mean, I'm the guy that sort of – brought sports radio into the focus here is I'm going to bring out my 25th anniversary documentary, but I've never seen anything like this sort of this sort of optimism where we're talking about a draft of a 13 and 14 that blew it in the AFC championship game at home with the best quarterback in the league. And they blew it, but they were in the AFC championship game at home. And sure. Like, and they're bringing back all these elements other than most of their coaches on the defensive side, but, and the baseball team is just getting going. Right. The baseball team's finding its legs and now has this owner who 
we're going to figure out, is he investing in Henderson, Rutschman? What's he building? Is it a casino? Is it a parking lot? Is it a tailgate? What $600 million get you these days? You know, who are they going to put up in front of it? So, you know, you don't get to ask him any questions, but although he doesn't seem like that kind of guy at all, um, this next couple of weeks, liars luncheon, getting into draft time for the Ravens Ortiz not being here. Um, you know, this was a pretty together group here in a way that probably unprecedented. I don't, I haven't gone through all the other 31 places. I would say there's some places where there hasn't been a lot of change in the department, but nothing like Newsom to Costa and really Bill a Carball, if you want to go back that far, but Ortiz has been for all of it. Cocainus, other than 12 minutes in Cleveland, for all of it. Savage left. They never brought him back, which tells you how they feel about him. He's running around with the Jets. I had a nice long conversation with Joe Douglas. So there's this spin of minds that have gone other places in different ways. And Andy Weidel and uh, Terry McDonough mm-hmm. from the original group. A bunch of Shaq Harris. A lot of guys went other places. But the Ortiz thing and running into him three different times down in Orlando last week, once with Jim Harbaugh, and uh, he let me know there's plenty of room if I want to become a Chargers fan. <laughs> like he said, that, you know, there's plenty of room there, and I I I, I saw that. Um, but different, really different. And and I think the Costa even mentioned maybe in Indianapolis, one of the rooms I I didn't have a press pass for to ask a question, but I saw him on a screen somewhere in the last two months saying it'll be weird looking and Joe's not sitting there. Hmm. Hmm. Different. Yeah, it'll be different, but you just laid out about five or six different examples of that happening in some shape or form on the front office side. And it's just like, you know, in that case, it's just like when players leave, right? Next man up. I mean, you know, guys have come back, you know, like George Kikinis, but you lose people. But at the same time, you're, if you're an organization worth its salt, and the Ravens have certainly been that for a long time, you're developing more scouts. You're developing you know, there was a point where Joe Ortiz was an entry-level guy. Eric DaCosta was an entry-level guy, you know? so Look, if I was sitting and talking to Bashadi about this and he were still speaking to the great unwashed like me instead of running from me on verandas and owners' meetings, which is just – I never thought I'd live to see – I mean, to say these things out loud that I've, I have witnessed. But the genius in this through all these years is – the Costa could have gone anywhere and he interviewed yeah. and people called and he denied interviews. Ortiz could have been in running the giants a couple years ago, amongst other places. They were both rumored to the bears. I think at various because everybody's rumored to the bear, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and I don't know what happens behind closed doors where they come back and get some more money and get a something, something, something added to their contract or, a, you know, <laughs> a, a, a summer vacation home. I don't know, you know, like, but, but there's been a management part of this for Bashadi, and he would say that's his genius in keeping and retaining good people. Uh, as I wrote about in Purple Rain too, back when I trusted him and believed in him, um, that keeping guys like th- th- this is a big deal, losing Joe Ortiz because they've managed to keep him all these other years. That at some point, it, it, it is a changing of the guard that he doesn't like, that he's not comfortable with from a manager. He likes what he likes, what he likes, and he keeps it around. And they managed to keep this together way longer than. Anybody could have, right? You know what I mean? Like Ortiz had chances to go other places and take that big job and get that raise, and somehow it never happened. And it happened now, and with John's brother, and it's all tied. It's it's weirdly steppered in that way, like yeah. in the way it's all held together. And um, but you know, this isn't the way Eric would prefer it. Eric would prefer to have Joe there, I would think. Sure, yeah, but uh, and you mentioned Bashadi. I mean, it precedes Bashadi. It's it's Ozzy Newsom. Right. I mean, Ozzy's still around, you know, I mean, he's still there on a regular basis. And so much of this, I mean, Ozzy was with Art coming over from Cleveland and that standard. It took a few years to really get going. And obviously Art, you know, with the financial realities of where the organization was its first few years in Baltimore and which is what spawned Steve Bishotti buying the team ultimately. But, you know, you start from that standard and it's continued now close to three decades and at some point in time at some point in time because nothing lasts forever and we this is a great example we're seeing it in new england with belichick out the door now nothing lasts forever so at some point in time it will end on 
you know, on various levels, but they've been really good at sustaining it. And when you have Ozzie Newsom and then a right-hand man, his lieutenant and Eric DaCosta, as long as they have, and you know, that you have that transition, which think about how many different times something like that would happen where it doesn't go as smoothly as it did. I mean, they really didn't miss a beat and that doesn't mean they make every perfect move or anything like that, but it was so seamless how that happened. And by no, there, by no, there have been no indications there was any ego whatsoever uh, with either of those guys in terms of flipping roles, for lack of a better term. Uh, you know, it's worked out really well. And I have no reason to think, and I say this with no disrespect, I'm quite fond of, of Joe Ortiz. I'm hoping he does well uh, with the Chargers. Uh, but, you know, I don't think, I don't think they're going to miss him to the degree that it's going to put them in peril. Let's put it that way. Uh, because they have always found the next person uh, to step up. You know, it might be someone like David Blackburn, for example. Uh, you know, they have people in their they have scouts and guys that have been around that aren't maybe, maybe household names to the way that you talked about some of the guys uh, of, you know, past Ravens, uh, you know, regimes. But, you know, they've got people that they're confident in. And, and I think you'll see some of those individuals grow into more notable roles in the coming years. And Hey, at some point in time, we'll be talking about the next general manager, you know, because Eric DaCosta will be ready to move on to the next chapter in his life or whatever. So, you know, it's just how this works, but they, they, they feel confident and they have a long track record of having a very successful churn in the way they bring young people in, they develop them, they work up their work, work their way up the ladder, either within the Ravens or they go elsewhere. Ian Cunningham's another example of that. Someone I remember you and I talked to when the Eagles were in the Super Bowl. He was one of their personnel types, and we've seen him interview for GM jobs and things of that nature. And he's, you know, working his way up the NFL executive ladder elsewhere. So, you know, that's just how this works. And, you know, Joe Ortiz, yeah, they'll miss him. Do I think it's going to be this death knell for them or anything like that? No, I don't, because I just think they feel confident in the people they still have there and people that are now going to be asked to do more here in the coming years. So you wish them well, but that's how this works. When you're successful, people, other teams want your people. And if you're going to sustain success, you better be ready to handle that. And one, to one their, less guy, they mostly have been. One less guy for you to have a salad with the little peas on it that they serve out there at the buffet at the Liars Luncheon. When is the Liars Luncheon? I need to know. Ever since Chad Steele took me off the list, you don't seem to realize. I don't get the press releases. I don't yeah. get any of the press. I don't know anything that goes on because I drink from the other water fountain now. Um, yeah. April 9th. Uh, you know, it's uh, a week, you know, the second Tuesday in April. So oh, they'll, they'll I'll have... be at Costas that day watching baseball. Sorry. Let him know. Yeah. Tell yeah. I'll so, miss him. Right. So, so, so I'll be out there. And, uh, I'll be in crab cakes questions and Costas. Which... I'll be slumming it. Hey, at the very least, we won't have to ask about Lamar Jackson's contract status at the Liars luncheon because we know, uh, you know, what kind of a reaction that got fr from the powers that be. So, but you know, it's, it's draft hey, what time. What will Chad Steele stand in front of the whole media this year and tell them they can't ask this year? I don't know, but it's draft time. We're at a point where free agency has very much calmed down. Uh, that's not to say the Ravens won't make a signing, won't make a move, but you know we're three and a half weeks out from the draft. There'll be excitement once we're on the draft, but when you are picking 30th, it is different than when you're picking 14th, you know, which is about the, as high as the Ravens ever pick, which is pretty rare even in that territory, unless they're trading up or what have you. But you know, it's it's definitely They've got some holes, there's no doubt, but at the same time, I, I think they've earned the benefit of the doubt to assume that they're going to address that. And that's not to say they'll be perfect, not to say they'll be as good as they were last year, which was best in the NFL until the AFC championship game. So, you know, it's just a matter of letting it play out. And, you know, pretty soon they'll be starting the offseason program. So they'll be out there running around in shorts and, and all that. So, you know, we're just kind of at that point where, all right, Free agency, for the most part, is over, uh, even if it's not over for the Ravens, given their history last year, even with Clowney and Van Ooy and what have you. But, you know, you kind of let it settle in and see what the draft's going to bring. So in the meantime, plenty of other things, exciting things going on here locally. And it's OK to focus on the Orioles almost exclusively right now. Ravens will be there uh, when the draft uh, kicks off here in, in about three weeks.
Yeah, see, the Orioles have uh, 124 more games before the Ravens have to play. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, and uh, they'll that's be. Why, that's why I always say, and look, I understand not everyone is a massive baseball fan, but when I hear people say, I can't wait to week one, I'm just like, no, wait, wait a second. I don't want to wish away the summer. You know, we've got a good, good baseball team here in town. Should be a lot of fun. You know, it'll be there. You know, it'll be there when the time comes and it, there'll be plenty of excitement as there should be when Lamar Jackson's your quarterback. But there's a lot of other exciting things going on here, uh, leading with the baseball team and new ownership and everything that can happen on that front. So if the Ravens take a little more of a back seat than we're accustomed to them taking. And look, it's the NFL. It's still king, but that's okay. You know, it, it's okay to to kind of focus on the Orioles for for a while. And yeah, you know, the Ravens will be there, and they're, they're working behind the scenes to kind of figure out the O line, figure out what the draft's going to look like. And you know, they've earned the benefit of the, of the doubt that the team that that kicks off in September, it, it, it they'll be ready to go. You know, they'll they'll be ready to go, and they'll most likely, assuming a healthy number eight, they'll be playing in January again. Do you know what the number one question I have received walking around the stadium all day Thursday? And I, I was out in the city on Friday. I was out at Costas. I, I, I've been out a, a little bit over the weekend, even my yoga class. Um, number one question to me is, hey, Nasty, they're giving you your press pass back. So I have an official pronouncement for, for everyone. Maybe. I am Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. We never stop talking Baltimore positive.